Don't turn away from Deuteronomy 6 just yet if you're in your Bibles. If you're using the PowerPoint, please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In your Bibles. It doesn't have to be on the PowerPoint. It's okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, we select these passages not just willy-nilly. I don't throw open the Bible and say, whoops, it fell open to Deuteronomy 6. That's what we're doing for our worship on Sunday. This is picked for a really good reason because we're in 2 Peter 1 today. We're talking about the responsibility we have to remind each other of the things of the Lord. And Deuteronomy 6 is one of the first places in the Bible where we see this pointed out very, very specifically. When we walked through this whole chapter during our worship time this morning, there were so many things in here. Again, I'm not preaching out of this chapter. I would love to right now, but we're not going to. But everything comes back to, don't forget what the Lord has done. We're a very forgetful people. All people are. Christians seem, though, to suffer from a very peculiar type of forgetfulness. Um, it seems to be a forgetfulness about the power that the gospel actually has. That instead of sharing it, we forget. We get okay in a comfortable laziness. It's a forgetfulness to fellowship with those and love those who are undeserving without a thought that you too were once undeserving and unlovable. A forgetfulness of our sure salvation as our assurance is lost with the advent of failing to grow. And this is what we're talking about this morning. In Sunday school this morning, I embarrassed a couple of people by asking them what I preached about last week. I was told by a pastor once, if you ever get too egotistical as a pastor, just ask people what your sermon was three days ago. That'll bring your pride right on back down again. And then I thought back. And I said, what did I preach on last week? And I had to sit there and think about it for a while. Some think because I'm... Whoa. I hope no one has epilepsy. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I had to think about it for a while. What did I preach about last week? I spent 30 hours writing it. I stood up here for an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes it feels like three hours preaching it. And I had to think about it. We're forgetful people. Do you know all over the Old Testament and all over the New Testament, there is the admonition to don't forget what the Lord has done. Deuteronomy 6 is rife with it. I think it says it three times. Don't you forget where you were without me. But we tend to forget where we are without God as quickly as we forget whatever the pastor said at the sermon because we got lunch coming. Mm. As people, we need to be reminded of things all the time. There's a statistic out that says that the average retention rate on a sermon at 72 hours, that's three days after it was given, not a 72-hour sermon, the average retention rate on a sermon, 72 hours out, is less than 10% could actually say the main point of the sermon. I'm not sitting here saying that you guys better start taking notes better. I'm saying we've got something that we have to fight against. And we have to admit it to ourselves. How many of you could tell me every single point from my sermon last week right now? Main point. I see three brave hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to call on you. Why do you think we're in the Bible so often? Are we preaching a new gospel every Sunday? Are we preaching new doctrine? We're preaching the same doctrine that's been preached for 2,000 years in the churches of the Lord. We're preaching the same gospel that's been preached for 2,000 years. Has it gotten old? No. That's the beauty of the gospel is it doesn't get old because we're forgetful people. And we need to be reminded of it often and often. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. I did not pick this passage because of what today is. I know I'm candidating today or it's candidating Sunday or... 
But this passage happens to be where we're at in 2 Peter. And we're going to talk about it just the same. A pastor's legacy. What is the main focus of a pastor? What is their point? Why do we have them? We're going to look at that a bit. God's people have always had a problem with forgetfulness. That's why he always says, Remember, I am the Lord who took you out of the land of Egypt. Remember where you would be without me. That's why in the New Testament he has the equivalent of it. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, with the great love with which he loved us, sent Christ. Do you remember every verse you ever memorized? I once memorized the whole book of James. Well, most of it. I think it's the last bit of the fifth chapter. But today, if you sat me down, I don't think for my life I could give you the first four chapters word for word. We forget things. You certainly don't remember every sermon ever preached. I don't remember everyone I've ever preached. That's why we have to remind ourselves and be reminded. And no message is more important than the one that the Word of God has for us, and that's why we preach it and preach it and read it and study it and consume it and grow thereby. That's the responsibility that we have to it. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Why do pastors exist? Why did God do that? And this is interactive this morning. Why do pastors exist? I want somebody to shout that out. Don't be afraid if you get it wrong. It's all right. To teach us. That's a great answer. In Ephesians chapter 4, God says that he has given to the church pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, and prophets for the edifying of the saints, for the work of the ministry, until all come to the unity of the faith of the body of Christ. To teach, to exhort, to train up. The main subject, rather, of Second Peter is false teaching and guarding against it. And so Peter, in introducing this, and yes, he's still in his introduction here, almost at the end of the first chapter, he comes in and says our, three, our four verses for this morning, Verses 12 through 15, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read it. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, and he's referring to his body, to stir, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for these four verses that we're studying this morning. We pray, Lord, you teach us with your spirit. Lord, challenge what we may have misbelieved. And bring us into submission to you and your word only by your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Why do we have pastors? I asked that question a minute ago. To teach us. To remind us. And you know the most important thing is? That's also the position of someone who is discipling another person. Let me ask you this. How many people in the church are to be discipling other people? How many? Throw out a random number. Say it again. All, 100% is another way of saying all, all of us, if we are still, as he describes it, in this tent, meaning our bodies, if we are still in this life, we have the responsibility of reminding everyone around us of the things of the Lord. It's not negotiable. I don't care if you've been a Christian for five minutes. That's your first and last and only job, to affect those around you onto the Lord. A pastor is one who is in the position that simply does that full time. And his job is to do that, to remind himself of it so that he can remind others of it. So that he can equip them so that they can go out and remind others of it. What's the goal of evangelism? Just getting people saved? I hope not. The goal of evangelism is fellowship. We want to bring more people not into this building. I don't care. This building's made of stone. This building's going away someday. It doesn't matter. 
We want to bring more people into the church, into Christ's church, not for the sake of saving them only, but for the sake of fellowship and to see them grow and to see them multiply. This is how the church has worked. This is how the church is to work. I'm not going to tenderfoot around the idea that this afternoon we're doing a question and answer session, which a lot of you finally get to ask me questions and hear my wrong answers. But the goal of all of this, what we're here for, and what I would see my responsibility here, the same as Peter sees his, I will let you down. I can promise you that. If you don't believe me, you haven't been paying attention to me already. But I will never stop reminding you and pushing you on to the one who will never let you down. That is the job of a pastor. It is not to be perfect. Pastors are not priests. I don't mediate between God and you. I don't have a special highway to heaven. I don't have a special phone that God calls me on and says, hey, this is what I want you to do at church. I don't know. God didn't say that to me. Pastors do not have a priestly responsibility. We all have priestly responsibilities. If you're in Leviticus, I want you to shout out this answer. Who is the high priest? Jesus is the high priest. And who now fulfill the role of priests? Us. We are all priests. Every single one of us have the responsibility of mediating between oneself and the Lord and bringing that message to the rest of the world. The same way the Old Testament priests do, we walk through this when we are back in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're being risen up a holy priesthood built up as living stones into the building that God is constructing, a temple within which are offered sacrifices worthy of the Lord. We are all priests. Peter today walks through this and explains this, but first I want to remind us of where we've been in Second Peter. Because when we come to something like verse 12, where it says like, for this reason, or therefore, or, or whenceforth, or whatever translation you have, it means it follows what he just talked about. And now I am going to ask, what did we talk about last week? These previous verses, 5 through 11. So I heard somebody say it. Say it louder. Salvation. salvation. Assurance of our salvation. Thank you, Lily. Very good. Assurance of our salvation. Let me ask you this. Is it possible to be sure of your salvation? Is it possible now to also be unsure of your salvation? Yes. It's actually a warning. And we went through that last week, and we're going to recap it a bit today again. Where have we been in 2 Peter already? Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith. Let me ask you this quick. Where does faith come from? It comes from God. We have obtained it. In fact, Ephesians 2.9 says, that not of yourselves. And it refers to faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. We have obtained it. Now we have a responsibility. What does he say? Verses 2 through 4 describe the precious promises we have that are ours because of that faith. That's all it takes for salvation. And we talked about that, the importance of salvation and how great it is. What a wonderful gift and what wonderful power God has to give that. But then when we come to verse 5, we see almost a paradox. After verse 3, where he says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, we come to verse 5 and it says, but also for this very reason, give all diligence and add to your faith. It says we've been given all things, but now we have the responsibility of adding to our faith. Add to our faith what? Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. 
And if you remember last week, we had a whole bunch of people standing up here holding those signs to depict what that was, what that was communicating to us. The importance of it. We add to those things. That's sanctification. That's growing in the Lord. In fact, Peter makes a straight beeline from that verse all the way to the very last verse in 2 Peter to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is what all of us are instructed to do. And he points out in verse 8 how important this is. For if these things are yours and abound, that word means increasing, we talked about that, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. And yes, he's talking about a Christian. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. The Greek word there is the same word from which we get myopia, meaning nearsightedness. You can't see beyond your own surroundings. Even to blindness. And has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And so this is the, this is the uh, correction, the encouragement he gives to us. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, and he's referring to all of these, adding to faith, grow in the Lord, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness and love. And knowledge, I forgot that. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Just in case that wasn't emphasized enough. If you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is where Paul comes and says, For that reason... I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. His description is that in any, and in any and every circumstance that I have, in any opportunity I have, and remember he refers to himself as a fellow elder in 1 Peter 5, the responsibility that he has as a pastor is to never stop reminding those around him of these things. You grow in the Lord. You do not be satisfied with being saved and just get into heaven. That in and of itself is a wonderful gift, to be sure. But if we're okay with just that, we are missing out on some of the most wonderful blessings that God has to offer. And we will live a defeated life. And we will live a life where we cannot be sure of our salvation because we don't see any fruit in our life. And this is where he says, this is so important, I see it as my job to always be reminding you of these things. And he drives that home today. A description of what he saw his responsibility of doing is reminding us of these things. If you're taking notes, I want to have you write down four points. Four points. Four aspects of a pastor's legacy. And I want to see it because it is spelled out here, plain as day. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't ever see it. Because we read over this and go, yeah, he's going to die soon. You know, yeah, he's in his tent, and whatever that means. And, you know, he reminds people of things. That's great. But he has a description here of the responsibility of a pastor and, by extension, every other Christian to remind those around him of these things. First point, four aspects of a pastor's legacy. First pa aspect, a pastor's legacy is gentleness. The word he uses here for remind, for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. This is not, I'm going to beat it into your head with a Bible. A lot of people have that idea about teaching. I had some teachers in college that were kind of like that. This book is your life, and it wasn't referring to the Bible, it was referring to like a biology textbook. Sleep it with it under your pillow. Osmosis didn't work that way, unfortunately. That's, I didn't do too well in biology. The word here for remind is a soft suggestion. 
We look at that and we go like, well, that seems really weak. How is that going to work? I mean, isn't the best way to teach people to intimidate them? If you don't learn this, I'm going to punish you in some way. Isn't that the best way to teach people? How many of you are teachers here or have been teachers before? Okay. Another hand raised. How many of you have had children before or babysat or have siblings that are younger than you or have grandchildren or great-grandchildren any of these things? You've been in a teaching role. Is the best way intimidation? Will they ever learn it or will they just follow you when you're there? The best way is not ruling by fear. We saw this in 1 Peter 5. It is ruling by example. When we came to 1 Peter chapter 5, he entreated the elders as a fellow elder. In fact, let's go back there. It's only a couple pages. It won't take too much energy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, here's the instruction to these pastors, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. I'm quite honestly sure that none of us have ever been a shepherd before. That's not really a popular uh, job around here. But I can tell you I used to shepherd goats. And you can't intimidate them to get into the stall. You have to nudge them along and show them the way. That's what he's using as a description. That's why a pastor is called a shepherd. Shepherd the flock of God. And remember, we talked about whose flock is that? It's God's. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly. And here's what I really want us to see today. Verse 3, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. You want a great way to lead your kids to Christ? You show them what it is to be God's. You show them what it means to belong to Christ. Not by simply reading the Bible every morning and that's about it, but you exemplify it in the way you treat them. In the way you live out your Christ-likeness before them. And not for them, you live it for God. The same responsibility goes out to all of us. Not just pastors, not just parents, siblings. You're a Christian, you have the responsibility of living lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we were in 1 Peter, we talked about it. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And he goes through a whole description of how that actually leads people from the sinful state they're in to being able to glorify God on the day of visitation. Go back to 2 Peter 1. For this very reason, I will not neglect to quietly suggest gentleness to gently remind you always of these things though you know and are established in the present truth. And I want us to realize this. The description here, he says, you are already there. You know this. But I'm not going to stop reminding you because what? People are forgetful. And we can very easily forget. In fact, the Old Testament example of this is take heed while you're up, lest you what? Fall. The higher one is up, the greater the fall will be. The bigger they come, the harder they fall. That's the same description. You take heed while you are up. He says, you know this. This is even the second epistle I've written to you. Same audience that 1 Peter was written to only three years earlier. You know this. You know this now, established. Foundation is what that means. Established in the present truth. And verse 13, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. And there we have something else. The second point. A pastor's legacy is love. A selfless love. 
When we went through Philippians in Sunday school, we saw something there that is spoken of here in the same way. At the end of Philippians chapter 1, Paul argues, he says, I don't even want to be in this life anymore. I want to leave this body. I, to be absent from the body, I'll be present with the Lord. That's going to be far greater for me. But I see it as necessary and beneficial that I stay in this body for your benefit. How many of you are Christians? Okay. How many of you are here? Great. If you're a Christian and you're here, you will no longer have an excuse not to know this. Your responsibility, as long as you have breath in your lungs, is to fellowship and to encourage those along to the Lord. As long as you have breath in your lungs, I don't care if you're 125. I don't care if you're 13. I don't care if you're 6. Or 30. Or 50. Or 29. We have that responsibility and we cannot pass it up. Push one another on. And specifically where Peter is talking about is a pastor's position on this. It's a legacy that he has for love for those entrusted to him. It's the second aspect of all disciples. And that's why I'm saying, yes, this passage applies to all of us. Much in the same way as we study Leviticus, those who aren't pastors can study this passage. No, it is not directly applicable in the same way as, as if you were a pastor. It's not. But the attitude is, you have the responsibility of affecting those around you for Christ. You do it with gentleness. You do it with love. And you do it with the next two things we're going to talk about here. Selfless love, however, for those that God has us ministering to is of utmost importance. Do you know why? Look at the end of that list. In verse 7, what's the end of that list? After brotherly kindness, after you've learned to love those who are your brothers, what is right after that? This isn't a hard question. It's the last word there in that verse. Love. Thank you. And we talked about that, the aspect of we learn to love our brothers that's actually easier. And we, by that, learn to love those who are unlovable, those who are still in their sins. It means we do not come at them with a self-righteous, better and holier-than-thou attitude. That's not going to convince anybody. That's not going to show them a Christ-likeness, because guess what? If Christ came and did that, which he was the only person in all of history that could do that, none of us would have ever been saved. His disciples wouldn't have followed him because he came and demonstrated for us to walk humbly with our God. And if you come on Wednesday night this week, you're going to hear a message out of the book of Micah that talks just about that. Third point. A pastor's legacy is hope. Look at verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. When he says tent, it's actually the word for tabernacle and temple. What is our temple? I, I see a lot of people mouthing it. Nobody's saying it. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what happens when we die? Do we cease to exist? No, we, we just leave this behind. We don't need it anymore. Now here's the other question. Why don't we need it anymore? We get a new one. We don't need it anymore. It's ruined by sin. In fact, that's why it's described all through the New Testament that the flesh makes us sin. It doesn't mean our physical body actually makes us sin. We are still culpable for it. But who we really are is not wrapped up in this body. Thank God for that. Who we really are is not just wrapped up in this body. It will leave it someday. And what Peter is saying here is, I've made my peace with that. 
And if you actually go into the Greek on this, you can actually see where he's suggesting that Christ actually let him know that he was going to live in old age and die a very violent, quick death. Can you imagine living for 40 years knowing that? This is in the late 60s. Christ left in the early 30s. It's been almost 40 years that he's known that he was going to suffer a violent death, but it was going to be at the end of his life. As you want to talk about a necessity for hope, how many of you are aware that you're going to die in the next hundred years? All right. Good. That's why hope is so basic in the gospel. In fact, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it says what? Now abideth these three. Faith, very, very important. Hope and love. The greatest of those is love. The first is definitely faith. But hope is sandwiched right in there for a very important reason. It's because without hope, there's no faith. Does anyone remember the start of Hebrews chapter 12 or 11? 11. Faith is the what? Actually, someone turn there and read it to me because I'm going to misquote it and I don't want to misquote that. Hebrews chapter 11. Call out the first couple of verses. The assurance of things hoped for. The convictions of things not seen. If you've got the New King James Version like I do, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means if there's nothing to hope in, there's no faith. Which means if we don't have an answer for death, we don't have an answer for life. We don't have an answer for sanctification. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Romans describe that things are which are seen are not hoped for because they're already seen. It's things which aren't seen. And it goes back to the story of Thomas once again with this idea of unless I see it, I won't believe it. And Christ comes to him, meets him where he's at, and he says, all right, here, put your hands here. Put your fingers in my hands, put your arm in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Christ says something very important. He says, you believe because you've seen. And here's Tim's paraphrase. Don't you know it's a blessing to believe and not see? Don't you know that's a blessing? Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And it's because hope becomes real then. You don't have to hope anymore for something you see. And Peter here is demonstrating that. He knows that his life is ending. And he continues on the road anyway because he has hope for what comes after that. The last point. Verse 15. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For the fourth point on the list. A pastor's legacy is disciples. Now I know that's not a virtue like the other three. It's not gentleness, love, hope, but a pastor's legacy is disciples. Self-replicating people. The Greek in here is those who can remind themselves. Those who are always able to remind themselves. He sees his job starting off. I will remind you of these things always. And I want you to be able to always be able to remind yourself beyond that. And if you're reminding yourself of these things, what does it say? You will have fruit. You will grow. Others will see that and you'll be able to remind them by your life what it means to belong to the Lord. We're able to remind ourselves of the real meaning in this, is the real meaning in this verse. Not only by the written letter, which is his immediate response to this, it also carries with the idea of now being able to remind ourselves of it, not having to depend on those outside of us to grow. Now, when we're young Christians, that is definitely a reality. We need to depend on others to remind us always. But we should grow with the ability to remind ourselves as we have access to the Word of God, and boy, if there is any generation in all of history that has no excuse 
to not know the Word of God. It is ours. We have access to it in an unfettered way. Do you know how many copies of the Bible I have, electric and otherwise? Hold on, let me count. Personally, I have 19 translations and I think 35 Bibles. Because I have access to it. We all have access to it. The vast majority of those are free. Don't worry, I don't just spend my, Bible, my money on Bibles. We have access to it. We have no excuse not to know it. And to be able to remind ourselves. And if that wasn't clear, basically he sees his responsibility to leave a legacy of those who are disciples of him to remind them always until they remind them. Basically, they're mature because he was obedient. And now they look for somebody else because now they're mature. They can teach someone else to be obedient. And then they can raise up. They're mature and they'll be obedient. How many apostles are left living to this day? Zero. Peter died. He's gone. Paul? Is he dead? James? Nathan? Peter, Paul, everyone, dead. Silas, Clement, they're all dead. I would have to take a stab that almost anyone born in the 1800s before were dead, are dead now, unless they're 113. Everyone's dead. How are we all Christians? It's because our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents, our great-great-great-grandparents, I'm going to lose my track here in a second, great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, all the way back. And when I say grandparents or great-grandparents, I'm not even talking about our physical ones. I'm talking about our spiritual ones who taught us and taught our parents and taught those who taught us and taught those who taught us who taught them. I think that's right is because that legacy gets passed down. That's why there's Christians 2,000 years later. It's because people matured, became obedient, and followed the Lord and passed that on. It is the job of a pastor. It is the job of every Christian. I just have the specific responsibility of reminding you every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening Monday during the day, Tuesday during the day, Thursday during the day, Friday during the day. Sometimes they take Saturday off. But we have the responsibility of doing this wherever we are. Peter sees it as the goal of his job. I see it as the goal of mine. You need to see it as the goal of yours. Going back to the natural forgetfulness that we are all on, I know that by Wednesday a lot of you have forgotten of what I've already said. That's okay. Because I'm going to say it all again next Sunday. And the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, as long as there is breath in my lungs, I will say it. And if there is anything that you will remember from this sermon, forget all my babbling for the last 40 and a half minutes, and remember this, this one phrase, don't ever, don't ever forget the importance of knowing your salvation and from your surety, passing it on to those in your influence. I'm going to say that again. Don't ever forget the importance of knowing your salvation and growing in it and passing it along to those in your influence. That's Christian, that's non-Christian, it doesn't matter. You push everyone on to the Lord. We discussed this back in 1 Peter. If they're not Christians, it's evangelism. If they are Christians, it's fellowship. It's the same attitude. We live submissive, obedient, humble lives before the Lord and we affect those around us for that. How is that done? How do we affect them? Well, let's go back to verse 5. An unending diligence that we add to our faith, virtue. Christ-likeness is what virtue is. Knowledge. You have no excuse not to know the Word of God, to consume it. 
self-control. Avoid and abstain those things which war against your soul. Stay away from things that pollute you. Stay away from things that annoy you. Stay away from things that drive you crazy and cause you to sin. Respond well to the situations in which you are. Control yourselves. Perseverance. We talked about that in a song this morning. We're going to pass through trials. We're going to pass through hard times. But it is there for the perfecting of our faith as it works patience in us. Godliness. We talked about this in Leviticus this morning. We reverence the things of the Lord. We have no excuse not to. We add to godliness brotherly kindness. We love those whom God has loved. And it took a very humble, self-sacrificial love to love us, didn't it? While we were still in our sins, Christ loved us and died for us. But beyond that, we add to our brotherly kindness, love. That love that the world doesn't deserve. That, life, that love that Christ showed us when we didn't deserve it. And you know what, as Christians... It is that love that we still don't deserve. We don't earn God's love after we become Christians. We don't deserve it, but we show it forth to our dying world, unashamedly declaring, as John did in 1 John, that this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is the message of sanctification. We don't take a light and hide it in a cupboard somewhere. We live it. We preach it every time we treat somebody with disrespect. We preach that it doesn't have any power when we do that. You are always preaching the gospel as one who holds the name Christian. Very, very few times are you actually called on preaching it with your words. You preach it with your life and with your actions. But that gospel ought to preach. It ought to be in your life. It ought to be in your soul. Let's pray. Our Father, how we desire to be in your presence in a permanent, unfettered, undistracted way, but find ourselves coming up short because we still reside here. But we know it's your will for us to reside here because we are here and you haven't taken us yet. Oh, Father, as we look forward to the time when we will be with you, may that change our lives now to live our lives not only for what pleases us, but live our lives to please you because you are the person we'll spend eternity with. Father, we offer sacrifices as acceptable as we can make them. Sacrifices of praise, of obedience, of loving others, even as Christ loved us. Oh, Father, teach us that humility. Teach us the responsibility we have to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to praise his name evermore. And for that, we will ever give you the praise, the gratefulness, and the thanks. May you guide us this afternoon, this evening, and the rest of this week as we proceed out to affect this world for you. And for that, we do thank you for giving us the strength and the courage. In your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, may his name be ever praised. Amen.